There are um, two ways to understand our relationship with God. The first one, as anyone who was raised in the West can do without any difficulty at all, can be portrayed this way. Welcome to Western theology. <laughs> this is God, that's you. And in that model, because God is up there and we are down here, it is incorrigibly hierarchical and therefore generically masculine. Welcome to Western theology. But it's only a metaphor. It turns out there is another way to understand our relationship with God, which has a great deal to do with contemplative prayer. It's only a metaphor, too. And before I draw it on the board, I want to remind you that um, it is also very well represented in Western religious traditions but because, as you'll see, it's more generically feminine, and we think it's therefore Eastern. It's not Jewish or Christian or Western, but it's there too. It just doesn't talk as much. God, and now you. That's the whole purpose for the blackboard. In the second model, God not only is everything, but everything is God. And you and I are present all the time, whether we know it or not, whether we like it or not, we are present within the divine. In the Yiddish, Als ist Gott. Dude, it's all God. <laughs> You can't keep that in your head. You can't do anything with that. I mean, you'd fry all your circuits right away. I, I am of the belief, I suspect you wouldn't be here at this early hour of the morning if you didn't suspect that too, that moments of realizing that it's all God are not just times when the roof flies off the building and we look up and we see the Mormon tabernacle singing Handel's Hallelujah Chorus and light streams out of our facial apertures and we get a new name. I, I never had one of those. I hope you have, but I'm 72 and the odds are against it. But what I do have frequently Quickie, everyday garden varieties of, and then it's gone. Moments of realizing, oh my God, it's all God, and I have been present within God all along, and everything that's happening is God. Does it mean it's good? Does it mean I got to like it? Because otherwise, how could it be there if it wasn't God? I don't want to start saying, oh, well, the dark side of the force made that. I don't want to say the Antichrist, Darth Vader. No, I don't want to do any of that. I want to say that it's all God, including the stuff I don't like. And my challenge as a human being is to figure out how it's all God. Not how it's good, not how I got to like it, but it's all God. Kabbalah is Jewish mysticism. It is a way to do Judaism. You can't do Kabbalah without doing Judaism. Kabbalah is Judaism on steroids. <laughs> Kabbalah is a supercharged way of doing all sorts of uh, Jewish things. Um, I wrote down a 
passage from Sholem. Gershom Sholem is the master historian of a Jewish mysticism, and here is what he says. In none of their systems did the Kabbalists fail to stress the interrelation of all worlds and levels of being. Everything is connected with everything else, and this inner penetration of all things is governed by exact, though unfathomable, laws. Let me read it again. In none of their systems did the Kabbalists fail to stress the interrelation of all worlds and levels of being. Everything is connected with everything else, and this inner penetration of all things is governed by exact, though unfathomable laws. Well, now I'm ready to try to give you a definition of a mystic. A mystic, therefore, is someone who has the gnawing suspicion that the apparent, apparent brokenness, discord, disharmony, cacophony, cuckooness, nothing fits together, everything's broken, life is a mess, conceals a hidden unity. That beneath everything, it's all God. And that a mystical experience is when you get it. Oh, of course. It's been all God all along. <clears throat> now this has some implications for contemplative prayer. You're beginning to fit the pieces together. Contemplative prayer, no longer do we have the luxury of having a conversation with God. You can't talk to something you're already a part of. You can't tell something you're already a part of that's already a part of you, something you don't know. I mean, in this, neither model is good or bad. Each has its use. I know some people who go back and forth, bi-coastal. <laughs> in this model, you can have a lovely conversation with God. Thank you for making, I'm, I'm, it's a pleasure to be a human being. I, uh, could you help me with this? Or God could talk to you. I didn't like that. I would like you to, oh, well, I'll do. It's a lovely, uh, and uh, uh, my colleague, Rabbi Moshe Waldeck, says God is like Jiminy Cricket on your shoulder. What do you think of that, God? Why? <laughs> <coughs> but in uh, contemplative prayer, there's no need for conversation. What we call prayer in that model is an opportunity to contemplate our presence within the divine all. And that turns out to be, as many of you suspect already, something that's much harder than simply talking to God. And the more you do it, the more you realize that the last time you did it, you didn't even, you weren't nearly as close as you are this time. It becomes more and more. I mentioned earlier that it was not always times of sweetness. Sometimes when you realize it's all God, you have to stop and think for a second, well, uh, I don't particularly like all these parts that are supposed to be of God. Uh, I don't like the dog dropping I stepped in on the street. Ah, sorry, you stuck, that's God. I don't, don't like pimples, uh, don't like dirt. Don't like eight up, it's all God. And that the challenge is to find that divinity, listen, in increasingly less likely places. Now, anybody can find it on a sunny Sunday afternoon when you're surrounded by friends, when you're surrounded by family, children, grandchildren, people that you love. Can you find it too though when uh, things are falling apart? Can you find it when you're visiting someone in, uh, in the hospital who has a terminal illness? 
Can you find it when you read the newspaper in the morning? The challenge, Mr. Phelps, therefore, is to try to find the divine in increasingly less likely place. Don't start with terrible things. Start with easy things and expand your God-lookingness into larger and larger circles. Let me give you a caveat. I'm trying to do a couple things at once here in addition to a meditation the organizers of this wonderful conference have insisted I talk a little bit about Kabbalah. Um, so let me say just a little bit more about Kabbalah. So it is the Jewish mystical tradition. There are many different mysticisms in Judaism. There are the Hechalot mystics of the second century. There's 16th century Lurianic Kabbalah. There are different ways of experiencing one's presence within the divine in Judaism, as there are in all world traditions. But for all practical purposes, Kabbalah today means a kind of Jewish mysticism that uh, began 12th century and reached its apogee uh, in the 13th century with the appearance of a book called the Zohar. Um, the Zohar claims to be a second, uh, written by a second century mystic Shimon Bar Yochai. Uh, we now have conclusive evidence that it wasn't written by Shimon Bar Yochai. It wasn't quite like the author of the Zohar was trying to pull off a ruse. It was more like probably he felt that he had channeled the ghost of a long dead sage. But for whatever reason, the Zohar described a new uh, series of dimensions to Judaism which took off and are still exploding to this day. Witness the increased interest in it in so many, in so many places. Um, there are four main new ideas that came with the Zohar. Oh, I forgot to tell you one other thing. Um, the real author of the Zohar was Moshe Ben Shem Tov de Leon. And uh, the Zohar itself is, uh, usually appears in three huge volumes. Professor Daniel Matt has just completed what, by my lights, is probably the greatest intellectual achievement in Judaism in our generation, which is translating the Zohar into English. Don't run out and buy it. You can't read it. Uh, uh, Danny is glad to uh, cite the fact that uh, 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 Yehuda Libus, another great scholar of Zohar, when he found out that Danny was translating the Zohar, uh, said that it is a project which is neither feasible nor commendable. <laughs> uh, Danny said he wanted to put that on the book jacket as a blurb. Uh, it, Danny's edition now is, uh, I think it's 12 volumes, uh, half of which, all of which are, are footnotes. Uh, it is something that you can read with a small group, little by little, although I'd recommend some other books that Danny has put together that are, <laughs> I call them oldies but goodies from the Zohar. Um, there are four big ideas that are so fecund that they're still operational. And indeed, the Zohar is so beloved by, by Jews that in, in uh, North Africa today, I'm told there are some synagogues that at the front of the room, they don't have just one ark for the scroll of the Torah, the five books of Moses. They have a second ark for a copy of the Zohar. Uh, the Zohar is easily the third canonical text of Judaism uh, after the Bible and the Talmud. For several hundred years, more Jews on the street could quote Zohar than Talmud. And that because American Judaism is, uh, grew out of uh, the German Enlightenment, uh, and therefore anything that was mystical got sort of torn out of Judaism, Jews today are now just rediscovering Zohar. Um, it was possible for me to go through uh, my entire rabbinic training in 
here it only mentioned once in passing. Whereas uh, one could easily imagine that in another generation or two, there will be several required courses in Zohar. OK, back to the, the new ideas that are in the Zohar. The, the first idea, and it's the biggest one, and I'll talk about it just for a minute, because I do want to get to some meditative time. In order to appreciate it, I have to teach it a couple Hebrew words. Uh, the first word is yesh. It's untranslatable in English. It sort of means isness. The way you say, I have a book in Hebrew, is you say, yesh li sefer, there is to me a book, yesh. Yesh means, and this will be a real important word in understanding a Kabbalist take on the diagram. Um, yesh means anything that has a definition, a beginning, an end, a location, spatial coordinates, anything, not just material reality. Love has a beginning, it has an end. Beauty, same thing. So anything you could say, anything about material, immaterial, my wristwatch, this carpet, this lovely theater, city of Louisville, the galaxy of Alpha Centuries, all of it. Yesh, yesh, yesh. Yesh is not bad. It's only bad if you think that's all there is. There's only one thing that isn't yesh, and that is ayin. And it's often translated as no thingness. <clears throat> ayin is the stuff of which everything of yesh is made. But ayin has no beginning, has no end, has no location, we probably can't say as much about it accurately as I've already said. It is the mother load of being. I'll give you a quick metaphor. All of being is an ocean, and everything that we can see in being are waves. Like it or not, every wave has its moment of glory, and like it or not, has its time when it will slip back into the ocean of iron and disappear, only to reappear as another wave, another thing, somewhere, and another time. So therefore, the Kabbalists call God another form of the word iron. They call God Ein Sof. It's often mistranslated as without end or infinity. Fooly, I don't like that. Ein Sof means the God of all being, the God that is the divine all, the ocean, the one of which we are all a manifestation and all made of. So that's the first idea of Kabbalah in, in the Zohar, namely that God is Ein Sof. Second one, which you've all heard about, and I won't even try to talk about much, is that thing with the little circles and the lines. You know, that, that diagram, you see pictures of a guy with the, like circles and all, called Sfirot. Uh, the God, God in Judaism has no story. It, it wasn't born, doesn't die, got no family. You, you can't say anything about him. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a disappointing for a storyteller like me. It's really, it's really very disappointing. All you know about him is what, he, what happens to people when they bump into him, but they can't, can't say any, anything about God. That doesn't stop the Kabbalists, though. I mean, they will insist that God is only one in all. That's what Jews mean when they say the Shema. You hear a lizard, Lord our God, the Lord is one. It's not that there's one God. Duh, everybody knows that. What we're really saying is, is that it's all one and that it's all God. Um, the spherot are an attempt to understand the infrastructure of being. The spherot are a pattern by which all creation is constructed. 
They are a diagram of the psyche of God. They are a diagram, therefore, of our own psyches. In understanding ourselves, we understand God. We understand the world. That's the spherot. And it's a, it adds to, uh, through the Zohar, it adds to everything written in Judaism, a whole other dimension of meaning. You thought it was Abraham and Sarah? Nah. It's happening between the spherot. It's all symbolic. Great passage in the Zohar. The stories in the Bible couldn't be about what they seem to be about. Otherwise, we could write better stories. <laughs> They're really about the spherot. And really about how those balance. There's a male side and a female side. Yes, there's some yin and yang to it. And that whole thing talks about how we have to put things back in balance again and restore the harmony and the balance in the spherot in ourselves, in the world, in God. You can fill in the rest. The two other ideas, one co co leads, uh, comes directly from that, is uh, <clears throat> called Tzorech Gevoha. Now, for the first time in Judaism, with the appearance of the Zohar in the 13th century, we are aware that God has needs, too. God says, I'm out of balance. I'm really messed up. And if we can just get, according to Kabbalah and Zohar, enough Jews to do Shabbos the right way, enough Jews to give enough tzedakah or charity to people in need, God can go, oh, oh, that was, makes Jews into sort of chiropractors. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, oh, you know, I, in the same way, you know, somebody to work on, with that. So that's why you can't, there's nothing to do in Kabbalah. Kabbalah just tells you this is a way to do Judaism and understand it as a way of, restoring the balance in yourself, in the world, and in God. And that, indeed, most scholars think is the reason why that the, uh, the Kabbalah was so enthusiastically accepted by Jews all over the world. Um, and, and, and fourth and last is the notion of zivug le'ilah, or I would say uh, bringing eros back into uh, the divine. Uh, <clears throat> before uh, the Zohar, uh, the god of the Jews hadn't had any sex since before the creation of the world. <laughs> and after uh, the Zohar, voila, there is now Eros in heaven, um, which leads some people to think that the Kabbalists were either uh, sexual innocence or dirty or old men. You get to take your pick, but the Kabbalah and the Zohar is quite willing to talk about sexuality. I, you can easily imagine from that simplest of four things why the notion of Kabbalah would be so exciting and thrilling uh, for Jews to, Jews to practice. Now, in the short time that I have, uh, I'd like to talk about something we can use as a meditative practice. <clears throat> Of course, we managed to get chalk, but we didn't get an eraser. So. Okay. Um, God has a bunch of names. The lowest level name of God is Adonai, which is nothing more than the Lord, as in the lords and ladies. Uh, if you bump into uh, someone on the street in Tel Aviv, you'd say, Slicha Adoni, forgive me, my lord, my good sir. And most of the time, when Jews see the name of God, they say Adonai, as a way of not mentioning God's holiest name. God's holiest name uh, is made of four letters, and it is called the Shem HaMephorash, uh, the awesome name of God. It's so holy, I can't even write all of it on the board, because then we couldn't erase the board, even though we don't have an eraser. <laughs> uh, 
in order to appreciate the letters that I'll put on the board in a moment, let me, uh, let me teach you how to read Hebrew without the dots. Yes, I can do that now, and I've got just a few more. There's a big clock up here I'm looking at. The way uh, the, the Phoenicians we know gave us the alphabet, um, but what uh, Professor Joel Hoffman demonstrated in a book about ten years ago, in the beginning, talking about the development of the Hebrew language was, I love this. Turns out that the Phoenicians gave us the alphabet, but the Jews gave us the vowels. I think that's hysterical. <laughs> and there, there are there. And I'm not talking about the little dots. I'm talking about there are three letters that function in the Hebrew alphabet primarily as vowels. If you want to make an E or an A sound, you make the letter Yud. If it's in the beginning, of, if it's in the middle of a word, it's always E or A. And then there is the letter Hey. And that's going to make Ah or aw sounds. And then there is the letter vav, depending if there's a dot here or there. When I learned Hebrew as a little boy growing up in Detroit, we said if the little boy saw all the cookies up on the shelf, he said, oh. But if he ate all the cookies in his tummy, he said, ooh. So I have <laughs> E-A-I-O-O-U. Pretty neat, huh? Those are the vowel letters. What do you think the root letters in Hebrew are for the verb to be? Am, is, was, are. You got it. Vowels. Something about being is non-consonantial. Vowels are the ether in which consonants linger. With the exception of the syllables, I dare you to make a vowel sound last for more than a nanosecond without sticking a vowel on the end of it. So these are vowels, and they are the root letters of the verb to be. And what do you think are the letters of God's most awesome, mysterious name? Bingo, you got it. Yud, hey, vav, and I won't put another hey on the end. Yud, hey, vav, hey. And that if you try to <coughs> transliterate them, as people in the West have done for a while, you get, uh, they, they make this a vav, and you come up with what we used to call the, the Burger King name of God. Uh, have it, Yahweh. That was the. Um, that name <coughs> is the name that according to the way Jews number the commandments, uh, according to the, the third utterance. Uh, that's the name that we cannot uh, trivialize or trash. It, it is, according to the 10 utterances, the 10 commandments, perfectly acceptable to say, God damn it. It may be rude and impolite, but the word God is just a generic name for deity. This is God's most intimate name. To know the name of God is to know how the world works, is to be able to access contemplatively how one gets close to being, uh, to realizing one's presence within the divine name. That's the holy name. How holy, oh, and another thing, you can take the name Adonai, and you take the, uh, the little dots for Adonai, and you can put them above and around the, uh, the yud hey and the vav hey, and that's how you get how to, per, how you, when you see it, you would know you would pronounce Adonai. If I took the word Adonai, and I took the vowels from Adonai, and put them on the vowels for yud hey vav hey, whenever I see it, I would know by secret handshake, say Adonai, but that's not how to pronounce it. Uh, and that's where uh, the name Jehovah comes from. Somebody didn't know you weren't supposed to pronounce it, and that they mispronounced it, and they tried to pronounce it, and came up with Jehovah, because Y's are J's, and I won't go there. <laughs> How holy was that name? How holy is that? That name 
could only be pronounced once a year by the holiest guy there was, the high priest. On the holiest day, Yom Kippur, in the holiest city, Jerusalem, in the holiest building, the temple, in the holiest room, the Devere, the Holy of Holies. It was so holy <laughs> that if the guy went in there to pronounce that name once a year, and God forbid he should drop dead of a heart attack while inside, no one could retrieve his corpse. So according to the Zohar, do you know how they solved the problem? They tied a rope <laughs> around his leg. I'm not making this up. <clears throat> and how would you pronounce all the vowels at once without sounding that you just, like you just had a great meal or something very romantic? without causing upper respiratory damage. I mean, blah, 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 all the vowels. How can you do all the vowels at once? Um, I will tell you how I think you should pronounce yud, hey, vav, and hey, all the vowels at once. You're already pretty quiet, but be even more quiet. I will try to pronounce it. There, I said it. <laughs> that is the name that we're forbidden to trash or to take in vain. That is the name of the one who brings into being all that is. That is the name of our God. And with each breath, we utter the name. And the challenge becomes, can we truly utter that name in holiness? So we have just a few minutes. And I'll suggest that you play with the yud and the he. Some people like to make that the inhale and the vav and the he, the exhale. And contemplate the yud and the he and the vav and the he. Some people even like to say the yud is the head and then the he becomes the shoulders and part of the arms and the vav is the torso and the other he would be the legs. There's a lot of stuff written about that. You can <laughs> go, home, go home and try it on your own. You can't go wrong. There's a lot of fun with it. But what you want to be aware of is, is that you are contemplating not only on the very process that keeps you alive, that brings you into being, but you are also reciting over and over again the name of the one of being. And uh, let us do that now for just a few moments. Uh, I would strongly suggest that you put your feet flat on the floor and you sit upright. And that you contemplate with me on the in-breath, the yud and the he, and on the exhale, the vav and the he. And I'll do it just for a moment or so to get us started. So, yud, he. Vav he. The one of being who brings me into being. Those who love me, those I love. Yud he. Love, hey.
yud hey, vav hey. The one who brings me into being. The one I love. yud hey, vav hey. That concludes our meditation.